Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through section 3.3 for Math 1040, measures of central tendency and dispersion from grouped data. Group data is going to be the focus of this section, and we haven't really been able to talk about group data or frequency data too much in terms of how to calculate with it. Uh, now we're going to approach how to do that. There's going to be two lists that we use, uh, or there's technically going to be four, but I ask you to have two lists already done beforehand. These two lists, uh, in L2 specifically, leave L1 blank. In the list 2, put the frequency list from the bottom of page 12, so 344 down to 2, put that into list 2. Leave list 3 blank, and then in list 4, put the frequency list at the top of page 13. So the number's from 31 down to 59. It's going to be a relatively short section. Uh, for group data, this is just what we're talking about when we say frequency data. We say it's grouped because I have multiple values that are in groups or classes, and we have some information that is lost. Um, even looking at that data down at the bottom of this page, I have numbers from 0 to 19,999, and apparently there's 344 values within that range. Unfortunately, I now don't know what those numbers are anymore. I don't know if they're all numbers that are around 10,000. I don't know if they're mostly around 18,000. I have no idea what they are anymore. I just know what range they are in. Which means that it's kind of hard to calculate exact values with this. But we need something to be able to do. Um, what we're going to do is instead represent each class with a midpoint. In order to find the midpoint, what we're going to do, this formula is going to be very important for you, what you're going to do is take the lower class limit and then the next lower class limit, not the upper one, the next lower class limit, and divide that by 2, i.e. you're going to find the average of the lower class limits. Those averages are going to represent our values instead of the bins or classes themselves, and we're going to use those to calculate everything. Up here we have some formulas that are some differences with that then, like if you're calculating the mean, what you can instead do is take each value and, sub and multiply by its frequency, then divide by the total frequency. And likewise, there's also variations for the standard deviation, but again, we're not really going to be doing this too much by hand. What we are going to do is do this using one var stats, so we are still going to do that. However, in this case, because we have group data, because we have group data, we are going to use that frequency list or that FREQ list option that we've been skipping over in 3.2 and 3.1. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. All right, uh, so here, this first example. Recently, a random sample of 25 to 34 year olds was asked, how much do you currently have in savings, not including retirement savings? Approximate the mean and standard deviation amount of savings using the TI calculator. Okay, so we have this data presented here, but again, I don't know what those values are inside of those classes anymore. I don't know what their exact numbers are, so it's hard to find a mean and standard deviation accurately. But we have to use it in some way. To do that, we keep the frequencies as they are, but we need to have a list for these savings as well, the actual values themselves. To do so, we're going to look at the lower class limits and find midpoints using those. So the first lower class limit is 0, and the next lower class limit is 20,000. If I take each of those and find an average, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do 0 plus 20,000. And I'm going to divide that by 2. That gives me an average of 10,000. That's going to be my first midpoint. That's going to be my midpoint for this first class, 10,000. Then I'm going to repeat that process. I am then going to do the next lower class, uh, so 20,000, and then the lower class following that to find the next midpoint. So 20,000 plus 40,000 divided by 2. That 60,000 divided by 2 gives me 30,000. So that's going to be my next midpoint. These midpoints are what I'm going to use to represent these classes themselves. And you would continue on this trend, keep doing this on and on and on. However, there's a nice pattern you might start to recognize, and I'll do one more so you can see it more clearly. Uh, the next one I would do is 40,000 and 60,000. So 40,000 plus 60,000 
divide that by 2, that's 100,000 divided by 2, that gives me 50,000. So that should be 50k. Do you start to see the pattern yet? If you notice, my first value was 10,000, and then 30, and then 50. You might be able to guess that the next one is going to be 70,000, or 70k. And the next one is going to be 90,000, and 110,000. They should all increase or decrease by the same amount. They sh there should be a nice pattern going on. And if you also recognize, the number that they're increasing by every time is 20,000. 20,000 is also the class width of all of these values. 0, up to 20,000, 40, 60, 80, they're all increasing by 20,000 every time. So really, all you need to know is the first midpoint, so we found 10,000, and then you can use the class width to find the rest. So I can type in 10,000 for my first value, and then I know my class width is 20,000, so I should be 20,000 past this, so 30,000. And then 50,000. Then 70,000. 90, 110, 130, that should be it. So those are going to be my values to use with my list. All right, so that's how you would find midpoints for each of these classes. This is also really helpful to know because really this last process would use 120,000 and then a non-existent next lower class limit. So it's good to recognize this pattern. All right, now we have the data, we still haven't answered the question. Uh, the question was, find the mean and the standard deviation. Well, we have our values in here, and we know how to calculate a mean and standard deviation with lists. We've done that before in 3.1 and 3.2. So we go to stat, we go to calculate, and run one var stats. We are still doing one var stats. Yes, there are two lists right now, but the only variable we are analyzing is a dollar amount. Um, how much do they have in savings? We're not analyzing two different variables. We never will use two var stats. Don't ever touch that. The primary list is list one. That's where my values are. It should always be your value list first. Again, if you don't have this wizard, hold on one moment. The second option is the frequency list. We've skipped this in the past and left it blank. However, now we do have a frequency list. The frequency list we have in L2. Keep in mind um, that if you ever use grouped frequency lists in your calculator, it may keep that there for future questions. So if you need to work with another question and you don't have a frequency list, make sure that frequency list is kept blank. If there is something here and you don't want it, hit delete or clear to get that out of there. So second two, we get L2. All right, if I run one of our stats on L1, L2 and hit enter, I should get my numbers I'm looking for. Now, if you did not have the wizard, what you probably had was just one very stats with a blank. What you would do is then hit L1, just as if we were to analyze that list, but then to get the frequency list, we need to tell it one more, and to do so, we'll separate them with a comma. The comma is right above the number 7, so you see comma, and then we could put L2. It will still follow the same order as your values and then your frequencies, always that order. Either way, we hit calculate, we find our mean. Um, in this case, it is a sample, so we are going to represent with x bar instead of mu. So x bar is 23,220.97. I will round to two decimal places here, because this is money. And then for my standard deviation, because this is a sample, keep in mind it's a sample, so we're going to use s. So we'll use 22,484. 0.51. So that would be my mean and my standard deviation. If it was a population, we would use sigma. All right, so that's the answer for that question. Do keep in mind, though, that neither of these values, the mean or the standard deviation, are really appropriate for this data. Just looking at the frequency list, if this was graphed, 
this data set would look like this, which would be incredibly skewed right. The mean and standard deviation are not very appropriate for this data. Um, I would probably use the median instead. And if we even look at the median, scroll down, the median is 10,000. That does a better job at describing the center of the data than 23,000 does. Okay. So that's how you do that question. We only have a couple more here because, again, group data is kind of a small topic. So shorter video today. Okay, this first exercise on top of page uh, 13 here. Again, I already have the frequencies in L4. I recommend having those there already. Uh, the following is the daytime household temperature that the thermostat is set to when someone is home for a random sample of 750 households. Again, sample, so that dictates how we identify summary statistics. Approximate the mean and standard deviation using the ATI calculator. Since we're doing a sample, we are going to find X bar and we're going to find S. However, to do that, we need to find midpoints and work with everything appropriately. First, the first midpoint, I see 57 and 61. So I'm going to do 57 plus 61 and divide that by 2. That will give me a midpoint of 59. So that's going to be my first value in my list, 59. Now, I can continue to do this. Or, as we showed before, all I need is the first midpoint and then the class width, as long as the class width is consistent. Looking at these values from 57 to 61, the width, or the class width, is 4. 57, 61, 61, 65, 65, 69, they're all increasing by 4. So likewise, I can take the midpoints and also increase those by 4. So 59 plus 4 will give me 63, and 67... 71, 75, and I need to go until I have a matching amounts of values as I do frequencies in L4. So 75, 79, 83, and that's it. Notice that these lists should be the same length. If they're not the same length, you will get an error when running one bear stats. But let's go do that. Stat, calculate, one bear stats. In this case, my list is L3. Notice that it kept the same stuff, so if I don't want a frequency list, I would have to delete that out of there. My list is in L3, and my frequency list, I do have one. It is in L4. So second four. Calculate. If you don't have the wizard, remember it'll look like this. One very stats, L3, comma, L4. Comma being above the seven. The mean we find here, again, it's X bar because it is a sample, is 71.26. With a standard deviation, because it is a sample, we will use S, so standard deviation of 6.08. Note that it is slightly larger than the population standard deviation. Now, this data has already been graphed for us here. We have this frequency histogram. Based on the histogram, we want to comment on the appropriateness of using the empirical rule to make any general statements about the thermostat temperature data. So this is kind of relating to the previous section, but also this section. Looking at this data, I'd see a couple different arguments. I think most people would argue that this is roughly symmetrical. However, some would possibly state that this is maybe skewed over in the right direction. Um, I could see that as well. Uh, depending on how you argue it will... Uh, or how you see it will change your argument. Um, I'll say that this data is roughly symmetrical. So the empirical rule is appropriate to use for this data set. The empirical rule, the mean, and the standard deviation are only appropriate if it was symmetrical. If you instead argue that this was skewed right, um, so I'd say this is your first argument. That's how I would probably argue it. If you instead said that this is skewed right, so a secondary way of arguing it, I'd say this data is skewed right. I can't. I don't really see it being skewed left, but I can possibly see it being skewed right. Uh, if the data is skewed right, thus the empirical rule is not appropriate to uh, use for this data set.
So it depends on how you see the distribution itself. Uh, I would definitely say that this is more symmetrical than it is skewed. Um, and you can even check that by looking at the data itself. We found the mean was 71.26. We can also check the mean in, or the skew and symmetrical by looking at the median. I find the mean is 71.26 and the median is 71. As we talked about in 3.1, if the mean and the median are approximately equal, that provides evidence that the data itself is symmetrical. The mean and the median are off by just a, a hair. They're off by 0.26 from one another. Therefore, I would definitely argue that this data is more symmetrical than it is skewed. Um, so you can always use the calculated data if you're unsure from the picture. Um, either way, we're going to answer a couple questions with the empirical rule. According to the empirical rule, 95% of days in the month, uh, the thermostat will be between what two temperatures? Well, by the empirical rule, 95% means you go up and down two standard deviations. So for the above value, I'm going to take the mean of 71.26, and we're going to add two standard deviations, so two times the mean of 6.08. Or you can just add 6.08 twice. I'm also going to do 71.26. I'm going to subtract 2 times 6.08. Both of these will give me the calculations I'm looking for. So 71.26 minus 2 times 6.08. Again, I'm using the values that I calculated. So 59.1 and 71.26 uh, plus... 2 times 6.08. So I get 59.1 and 83.42. So 59.1 and 83.42. So I'd say that the temperature would be between those two values. And lastly, according to the empirical rule, what percentage of days in the month will the thermostat be above 77 degrees? All right, well, I don't, not exactly sure where 77 is according to the empirical rule, but we can find out. I know 77 is above 71.26 somewhere, so let's see how far away. If I do 71.26 plus 6.08, that, well, I did minus, sorry, 71.26 plus 6.08, that gets me to about 77.34, so almost a little bit above where I have uh, for 77. So not exactly exact, unless we were supposed to round to whole numbers before. Um, if we round to whole numbers, it would be more exact. Um, but 77 seems to be one standard deviation away from the mean. So if I were to draw that, one standard deviation away, and then I want to find the area above that. Well, I'm going to find that by doing 100 minus the value for one standard deviation is 68%. That should be the value here. If I do 100 minus 68, that gives me the area in both tails. And to find just one of those, I cut that in half. And if you remember from 3.2, this number should look familiar, 16%. All right. Now, that's it for 3.3. It was really just talking about how to deal with group data, so kind of a small section. Uh, with that said, you should be able to complete the uh, homework for section 3.3. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, put comments in, or ask your instructor. Uh, but with that said, I hope you have a great day.